Um, is everything okay? Okay. Praise the Lord. Mama's keeping care of house here. <laughs> Amen. That wasn't mine. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Good. The things you see at church, right? <laughs> you never know. We've been on a series just talking about faith, walking by faith. And uh, we've certainly, uh, it seems like we just can't, we get so far and then we just stop and we keep just digging and picking and we're going to continue to pick and dig tonight again just in this topic of walking by faith. You know, Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, he said, for we walk by faith and not by sight. He says we walk by faith and not by sight sight, right? We don't walk by our senses. We walk by faith, right? It's our responsibility to, 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 uh, to understand what faith is and to, uh, to build our faith. And I'm going to talk about that tonight, about building our faith. But I want you to know something. Faith is to be a lifestyle and not a crisis tool. Now, listen to me now, because I, the, the problem is not with your faith. The problem is with the use of our faith. Okay, we, we're, not, we're, we're, we're developing and growing our faith, but I, I want to I flip the coin just a little bit. It's not that we're developing and growing our faith. We're actually de- developing and growing, growing the use of our faith. Because we all have faith in here. Every one of us. So I want us to think about that tonight. Your faith can grow, but it's growing because you're using what you got. If I, listen, some of you guys in this room are, have, are activating your faith. You're living by your faith, man. You're believing God and speaking over situations. And there's some people in this room that you've, you've not done that for a while, and it's time to reactivate your faith. It's time to reactivate what you know. It's time to reactivate these things. Start speaking and praying and decreeing and declaring over your life. So I just want you to know tonight we're going to talk about that. So what is faith? Let's define it again. Faith is what you believe, what you're convinced of, what you're persuaded of, what you're convicted of. Bible faith is about perspective. That's what it's about. It's about what you're seeing, the ability to see. So it's your trust and your confidence, what you're convicted convinced of and convicted of but bible faith is about a perspective it's the ability to be able to see when you got born again eyes got put in your heart and now we can see things that nobody else can see now i don't have to walk by my senses i can actually walk by faith now i can do that you guys with me are you all right so unger's uh bible dictionary calls he says faith or believing is this it's not simply the ascent of the intellect to reveal truths It is the practical submission of the entire man to the guidance and control of those truths. So I know what I'm convinced of and I know what I'm convicted of by what I'm doing. By me, uh, how do they say that? Um, uh, The submission of my life to those truths. I can find out what I'm believing real quick if I'll just listen to what I'm saying and what I'm doing. That'll locate you. Now, we can say that and we can throw around the word faith and throw around the word believe, right? But it's a simple concept, but it's very hard in the sense of us walking this thing out. Because there's, the enemy's trying to get you not to believe. He's trying to get you to have fear. He's trying to get you to doubt. He's trying to get you to have unbelief in your life. You guys all right here? So, faith, faith. Now, go with me real quick to Romans chapter 5. We'll start there tonight. I'm trying to pick around. Are you guys all right? Anybody cold in here tonight? Okay. All right. We need some help back here, ushers. So, I, I, we had a resounding, that was almost, it blew me off of the po- <laughs> Usually, it's like one here and one over there and one back there, and it's, it just doesn't work. But that was like, yes, turn it up. Faith is the way that God's going to provide for your needs. Check check this out now. Faith is the way that God is going to provide for your needs, right? So so God, 
Now, remember, last week we talked about, I'm trying to find out that this, you know, it's kind of like a line, by, or trying to like sometimes up here, you know, with these series, you're trying to wait for the hole to open up to see which way I need to go, right? Last week we talked about grace and faith and how they work together. Grace is everything that Christ has provided for us through his finished work. Everything. Remember now in the Old Testament, I, mean, I talked about this last week, the Old Testament, it was my doing that brought God's blessing. And I showed you how God flipped it, and now in the New Covenant, it's God's blessing through Jesus, and now my obedience to what he's telling me to do, I get to participate and begin to unlock the blessing in my life. Amen. So grace is everything that God has provided for us in Jesus Christ. So faith takes what grace has already made available. So my faith is the positive response to what God has already provided through grace. So only thing I need to do, I need to increase my confidence in what God has done through Jesus. That's where I'm going to get to. That's what I'm trying to get to in this series. Is that we're trying to get to the place that we become confident in the Father, His nature, who He is. And begin to understand that it's all belong. it all belongs to us. And it's my faith and my believing in the finished work. Now in Romans chapter 5 verse 2, the Apostle Paul writes this. Through whom, talking about in Christ, through Christ also, we have access by what? Into what? Faith gives me access to God's grace. Faith gives me access to God's grace. The way that I access all that God has for me is through my faith. Now, in this room, we would all say we would want to have stronger faith, correct? Right? We would want to say, we, we, we all would say we want stronger faith. Well, the Bible seems to indicate strong faith, weak faith, little faith, big faith. There's, he seems to quantify it. He seems to quantify it. He seems to, uh, he seems to say that there are times in our lives that we can have little faith. There are times in our life that we can have great faith. There's times in our life that we have small faith. So I want to show you tonight, how do we do this? How do we do this? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? How do we grow and develop our faith? How do we grow and develop our faith? So you're in Romans. Go to Romans chapter 4. And this is where we'll... Let's start in verse 16. Very familiar set of scriptures talking about Abraham. Verse 16, it says, Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace... So the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. This is now quoting from Genesis. God is saying, talking to Abram, right? In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And, being not, or, and not being weak in faith, talking about Abraham, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened or strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced, being fully convinced, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Now, Abraham is, is the father of faith. That's what the Bible says, right? He, he's the father of faith. Why? Because Abraham believed God in Genesis and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It wasn't about law. It was about him believing and he is the model, he's the, he's the New Testament model of faith. He's the model. 
Now, I think this is interesting because to be the model of faith, God had to put Abraham in the most hopeless situation, so the only way out was God. 25 years. 25 years. The promise was made 25 years later is when it come to pass. Now, now check this out. The Bible says not only Sarah was dead, but Abraham was dead. God made sure they weren't working. Both of them. Right? They weren't working. So, so God, he said, listen, I'm going to make, make this. And you can read this in Galatians and how he talks about how Abraham is the father of faith. And, and, but I want you to see something. Is that God had to, had to put him in a hopeless situation. That way he can be a model to faith for us. But there were some things that he'd done in this process, and I want to touch on them. Strategies for developing your faith. Now, I want you to understand something again. When I'm talking, you've already got faith. you got the same faith. you got the God kind of faith. When you got born again, for by grace are you saved through faith, Right? And that is not of yourself, right? It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen, faith is a a grace gift to you. When you got born again, you you got infused with faith. Right? It's the same faith. I could sit here and talk to you. Romans 12, 3. It says, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. He's dealt to every person the measure of faith. You couldn't even get born again without faith. You had to have faith. And it's not even your faith. It's Jesus' faith that's on the inside of you. Where I've been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Check this out. Listen to what I said. You've been given Jesus' faith. It's, your, it's Jesus' faith that's on the inside. It's not even your faith. It's Jesus' faith that's on the inside of you. Isn't that good? Come on, isn't that good? I can know this. I can understand this. I can understand that God... Now we understand when John 14 where Jesus said, The works that I do, you can do also. Why? Because of Jesus' faith. Isn't that good news? Right? You've got the God kind of faith on the inside of you. So it doesn't matter how long you've been born again. Everybody has the measure of faith. It's just whether you're using the faith you have. That's what determines great faith or little faith. It's the faith that I'm using. Let me ask you a question tonight. We've all been here. We've all been places in our lives we've had little faith. And we've had times in our life we've had big faith. But it's not about, it's not about, well, you know what, it's, it's because God has dealt a little more to you than somebody else. And he gives us all the same measure of faith. It's just whether I'm using that faith. Amen. I need to use. So the development of my faith is the development in using it. I, I, I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is to be a lifestyle and not a crisis tool. Right? It's something I live by. So when was the last time you picked up a situation in your life and you're you're speaking over that situation and and praying about your situations? Come on now. Reactivating what you got. So strategies. Number one is this. Feed your faith. Simple. Feed your faith. Feed your faith. Right? If you notice what it says here in uh, Romans chapter 4. Verses 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was what? According to what was spoken, so shall your seed be. He kept his focus on what was spoken. He kept his focus on what was spoken. We have to hear the word of God for faith to be developed. Faith comes... By hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Abraham heard the word. He heard the word. He heard the word. You mature your faith, you develop your faith by consistently reading and studying Scripture. Now, this is why the enemy will fight you to the nail to get in the Bible. Will he not? Will he not? Why? He understands this. So we got to understand. Listen to me now. Listen. Jesus was preloaded with the Word of God. He was preloaded. In, in Luke 4... In Luke 4, it says he came out of the wilderness, right? And when he came into, in, in, into his own hometown, right? After he came out of, his, out of, out of there, he, he knew where to find himself. Right. He found the place where it was written. He found Isaiah 61. Well, I mean, if you just roll it back a little longer in the wilderness. What was going on in the wilderness? If you are the Son of God, what was his response? It is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus was preloaded with the Word of God. And you've got to preload yourself with the Word. It seems like the only time we go to the Bible is when we're having difficulties. When we need to go to the Bible on a consistent basis, I need to feed myself the Word of God. I need that. Amen. That's why you keep eating. Let me ask you guys a question. Do you remember what you read? Do you remember what you ate last, last Tuesday? Now, maybe it was it that good. Maybe if it was that good. But do you remember what you ate last Tuesday? But you know it was good for you. Right? It's the same thing with Scripture. You eat. Because you know what? It's good for you. You eat. So th there's no excuse anymore about not understanding Scripture. There's plenty of good translations out there that you can understand. But listen, it doesn't mean you have to remember everything you're reading. Just eat. Just eat. Get you a cup of coffee. Get you a Mountain Dew. I don't know, whatever it is, a honey bun or whatever it is you like. And, and, and start reading the Bible, man. Are you with me here? Joshua 1.8. Look what the, what the Bible says here. Joshua 1.8. I love this. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have what? Good success. How does prosperity and success come to you? By meditating in the book. Meditate. The word meditate, right? It's a word that means to maul over, to speak, uh, mutter to yourself over and over. M muttering, muttering, muttering to yourself, muttering to yourself. Talking, talking, talking it over, keeping it in your mouth. So if you're talking to yourself, you're, you're in good company. You're, you're scriptural, you're biblical. But what you're doing, you're, you're, you're continually Chewing on that. Let's listen, let's stop reading the Bible to get it to get so many scriptures in. Let's go and read the Bible for something. One, one word from God can change your life. Because that's where faith comes. Faith comes by what? And hearing by the Rhema. The word word there is Rhema. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Rhema. What is a rhema? It's a word spoken to you for that moment, in that moment. So all of a sudden you're reading the Bible, and all of a sudden Holy Spirit comes and breathes on that word, and it pops off the page to you. That's a rhema, and in that rhema there's faith. In that rhema there's faith. And that's how faith comes to us. Faith comes. By hearing and hearing by the word of God. You guys all right? Hearing over and over and over. You say, why do I need to read? Because listen, I, okay, if grace has already provided everything that I need, how many would say amen to that? Right? And faith is what's going to access it. 
I need to find out what's been made available to me. Okay. And I need to find out. <coughs> I need to find out, sorry. <coughs> I need to find out the nature of my father, who he is. My faith will never operate if you're thinking about God not wanting to help you. He's mad at me. Right? I mean, I like this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Check this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. Now, a lot of people, they stop right there. Well, don't you know? God won't, won't allow, you know, you ever heard that people say that? But how does this work? How does it work? But will with the temptation. He makes the way of escape that you can bear it. Well, God will never put, you, put too much on you that you can bear, sister. Why? Because he's making a way with every temptation. There's a way of escape that God's providing for us. Now, I want you to see it in the Amplified. Because this is why I'm saying about feeding your faith. And getting yourself all, just staying in the book. Because I want to know who my father is. For no temptation, no trial regarded as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads, has overtaken you, laid hold on you, that is not common to man. That is no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance, that is not adjusted and adapted. Let me just go to, yeah. And belonging to human experience, as such as man can bear. But God is what? To his what? And his what? Why am I getting to the book? Because I got to find out that God's faithful and he has compassion. I got a compassionate nature. See, if I don't know who my father is, I will not be able to do this. I won't be able to walk by faith because I'll all the time be in doubt whether God wants to help me or not. I'll tell you what, go to, follow me, Mark chapter 1. Just follow me up there. I'll just turn around. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 maybe? 39? Maybe? 39? 40? We'll see. Let me see. Mark 1, 39? Maybe? Verse 40. Yeah, here we go. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you're what? If you're willing, you can what? Okay, hold on. What's he saying? He said, if you're what? You can make me clean. So he's questioning. He, he knows God has power, but he just doesn't know he's willing to do it for him. He said, if you're willing, you can, you can do this. If you're willing, how many of you know that God's willing to touch us? God's a good father. How am I going to find that out? I'm going to find it, man, through the book. Verse 41, look what happened. And Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing to be what? The word compassion there actually in the original word, there's, uh, there's, some, there's some ample evidence that could mean that Jesus got very angry, not at the man. Because why? He said he was getting mad because this man didn't know who the father was. Angry, not at him. Yes, I'm willing. How do I find? I got to feed. I'm telling you, listen, when I get preloaded with the word of God, it starts, I now can go to a place that I can begin to activate what I believe. Right? I can activate this thing. Amen. Look what it says here in Romans 4. Look out in your Bible real quick here. In Romans 4. Look at this. Look at this. In verse 19. It says, Abraham was not weak in faith. And not being weak in faith. What's the next words? He didn't consider his own body. Abraham did not consider his body. Let me ask you a question. 
What are you considering? The word consider means to pay attention to, examine, focused attention, to fix the eyes on, to take into account, to make allowance. What are we focusing on? Right? What are we focusing on? What's the enemy trying to do? He's always trying to get our focus. The broken focus, the broken focus, the broken focus. Right? The devil wants you to operate in the realm of reason all the time. We talked about this before about how believing is a simple thing, right? It's like gas. It's like, you know, you can have, a, you can have this nice car, right? I, I explained this the first week. You have this nice car with all the, the digital everything on it. You can have the, uh, you know, the, the GPS. You can have all that stuff. But it ha- if it doesn't have one simple thing called gasoline, none of the other stuff works. Isn't that amazing? It's the same thing with faith. I don't have to figure it out how God's going to unscramble the eggs and how he's going to work it out. All I got to do is keep putting gas in the car. Amen. Keep turning the engine on. I don't have to understand. I have no clue about how cars operate. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Your body, do you, do you understand your body? I mean, we was with mom. I had to take mom to the doctor today for a follow-up appointment. And I was up there, you know, the, 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 the person that's medical, I like that kind of stuff. And I'm looking around, at the, sitting there looking at the filtration system of the kidneys. That was interesting. I started laughing. I think, man, that was good. That's, 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 uh, that's nursing school stuff. I like that. And I started thinking about, and started talking about the body and how it filtrates, you know, so many quarts of, of blood a day and how it puts out so many quarts of, of waste a day. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a complex system. Well, all I do is just keep. And you know what happens after that? It's all living. Right? <laughs> because I don't have to worry about how, to, how it's going to operate. I just got to feed the machine. I need to do what needs to be done. I don't have to worry about how God's going to work it out for me. Yeah, I just know he's going to what? Go work it out. Because he's a good dad. We say, well, Pastor Paul, I've been believing God. Well, listen here, man. Don't li- I understand stuff happens. Things happen. God never promised us that we would, we would have rose gardens. But he always said he'd show up and he'd be faithful. He'd help you through every single time that you go through. Right? Amen. Abraham was strong in faith. He says, what? He's strong in faith. He considered not his own body. What are you considering? He didn't focus on his body. He focused on the promise. He didn't focus on the situation. He focused on the promise. That's what he says right here. He said in verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through what? Unbelief. I'm talking about feeding your faith. What are you feeding yourself? He said he did not waver. He did not waver at the promise of God. The word waver means to discriminate. It means to make a distinction. God's the same God. For Abraham, he's the same God for you. Don't waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Don't waver. Don't discriminate. He's the same God. Jesus Christ the same what? Yesterday, today, and what? Forever. Amen. So I'm going to feed my faith. I'm going to get into the book. You know, we sung this song, Jubilee. And, and I know you don't, you, you have to understand something, that God spent three chapters in the book of the Le- Leviticus. He spent three chapters talking about something called the year of Jubilee. Check this out. I, I want to help you here a second. The year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee was a year was a year, it was the 50th year. Seven Sabbaths of seven, 49, and on the 50th year was what they called the Jubilee. Now the Jubilee year, see, over that 49-year span of time, people got into debt, they sold land to get money, they even sold themselves. Property, possessions... And all of a sudden, on the 50th year, 
the 50th year. It was called the year of Jubilee. And all land, all possessions, and all property was returned back to its rightful owner. That's what the Jubilee is about. Now what's interesting is because Jesus in Luke 4. It's Isaiah 61. He quotes from Isaiah 61. Jesus stands up and quotes from Isaiah 61. They hand the book to him. He's supposed to turn to page 222 and read the, 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 the prescribed reading for the day. They handed Jesus the book. Jesus takes the book, breaks all protocol, and flips the Isaiah 61. He found himself in the book. So he went to the book and he starts quoting Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for God has anointed me to preach the good news, the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, set at liberty those who are bruised and oppressed. Then he goes right down here, the last thing he says this, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Guess what the acceptable year of the Lord was? It was the year of Jubilee. So Jesus stands and proclaims, I am the Jubilee. I'm returning everything. Man, I feel that. I'm returning everything back to its rightful owner. Could you imagine the courthouse? No, no, no. Just, just play with me a second here. Just, just let, come on. Let me just, could you imagine the courthouse on, on the day before the year of Jubilee. They're in there trying to find deeds. I, I, know, I, I, know, I know that property because if they, had, if they had a record that that land belonged to them, guess what? They went and presented that to them and said, this belongs to me. You couldn't get it unless you had the deed. Come on, church. Why do I, t I'm telling you and I and all of us to feed our faith because this is the deed. This is, we are operating in a perpetual jubilee. I don't have to wait 50 years. I am in the jubilee. Jesus is the jubilee. But listen here, the lamb will never come back to you. The things and possessions will never come back to you if you don't have the deed. If you don't know what the deed says. This is our deed. This right here tells us what belongs to us in Jesus. The enemy coming, trying to get you out, trying to tell, tell you you ain't going to make it. And if you don't know the word, if you don't know what he says, feed your faith. Start to eat. Are you guys with me? Hallelujah. You say, I got to be around people of faith too. Let me just say this about feeding your faith. You got to be around people of faith. If you're working 60 hours a week and all the thing you're hearing is everybody's cussing and carrying on and the aggravation, I'm telling you something, you wonder why your faith is all, all is, is, it seems weak. You need people of faith around you. Let me tell you a story. This was uh, last Saturday. I ran officially a half marathon. I finished a half marathon. I set a goal and I worked at it. And I ran it. But crossing the finish line was not the greatest part of my day. The greatest part of my day happened at 10.5 miles. I had been following a boy for 10.5 miles. His red shorts. I was chasing his red shorts all day. <laughs> <clears throat> truth this is a true story we had we had whatever that is what a mile and a 10.5 so what is that 13.1 whatever that's left huh there you go glenn glenn help me <clears throat> at two we had 2.6 we were going to be fine i was watching my watch it was we was going to be good we he we was going to get that under two hours it's going to be good you know it, 10 miles it starts getting tough mentally it starts to get tough so this boy come up and I started gaining on him. He's probably 25, 26 years old. And I started gaining on him. So I pulled up beside of him, cruising. And I said, hey, buddy. I said, I've been following you for the last 10.5 miles. I said, you're going to make it. Now, this is my best part of my whole race right here. Didn't know it. 
He, he looked at me and he said, I am tired. I'm not going to make it under two hours like I wanted. I said, you're going to make it. So I started talking to him. I started talking to him. I said, you're going to make this. I said, it's getting hard right now. It's mentally. I said, just push through. Your body will do this. And he looked at me and he said, have you ever done this before? I said, once. <laughs> I don't care. I've been there one time. I said, have you? He said, nope, never done it before. I said, I have. We're going to make it. So I went and I reached into my pocket and I handed him an energy gel. It has calories in it. So I gave it to him. I said, here, take this. So we was running. It was running. We just run. He was struggling. I just kept talking to him. About 11 three-quarter miles, 12 miles. Next thing you know, he left me. <laughs> Finished ahead of me. But it was the greatest thing ever. Because, listen, it's the same way in our faith. See, you know what? I need people around me that's going to encourage me. Because, you know, there's times that I want to quit. And I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. I don't think I'm going to be able to do one more step. And someone pulls up beside of me and says, you know what? You're going to make it. You're not going under. You're going over. I need people of faith around me. If I want to feed my faith, it's not just getting in the book. I got to get around people that will help me. The first thing the enemy always tries to do is cut you off from people. Right? He, 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 he takes and he dice, isolates you from people. You guys with me here? All right. So feed your faith. And the last thing is this. Exercise it. Start doing something with your faith. It says that Abraham was strong in faith and he gave glory to God. Right? He gave glory to God. He exercised his faith. Faith that is unchallenged remains unchanged. You're going to go through stuff. But it's in the middle of the stuff, your faith gets strengthened. Just like that boy, he's been there now. So the next time he's chasing some guy with red shorts, he's going to be able to pull up beside of him and say, I've been here before. We're going to make it. We're going to make this thing. Right? You go through stuff. Your faith is going to be strengthened by, your, by what you're going through. When I have resistance, it's an opportunity to grow and exercise our faith. Just stay in agreement with God. You say, well, how do I, how do I exercise? I'm not doing this justice, but listen. How do I exercise my faith? I'm going to tell you how you exercise your faith. You've got to start speaking this stuff. Get the word in you and start speaking it. Start. Uh, James 2 says, Faith without corresponding actions is dead. Start doing something with your faith. You say, well, how do I, whatever it is in your life, whatever it is that you need, start exercising your faith. Quit rolling over. Man, our faith is like a, and you guys have heard this illustration, it's like a rabbit dog. But what good's a rabbit dog if you just keep the thing on the chain all the time? Right? Or if Bruce was here, it'd be the squirrel dogs. Or if a coon hunter was here, it would be a hound dog. What, what's, it, what's, it, what's it going to do if it's just in the cage? Bring God into your situations. What do I do? Find it in the title deed. Find what Jesus has promised. Focus, meditate, chew it over. Right? Right? And start to decree and declare. Declare what God says about you. Jesus was faced with this question. I'll close right here. Luke. Uh, what was it? Luke 17. And the apostles said to the Lord, what? Isn't that what we say all the time? Lord, increase our faith. Now check this out. Look how Jesus responded. He didn't say, yeah, I'm going to do that for you, boys. Yep, going to happen today. Yep, I'm going to take my magic wand and I'm going to, I'm going to increase your faith. No, he says, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. 
You can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. What did Jesus say? If you want to increase your faith, start using what you got and start planting it into, in your situation. Just start planting it. Just plant your faith. Use what you got. Make sense to you guys? You guys are all right. So you say, well, how do I increase my faith? Start using it. It's a muscle. If I don't use my muscle, right, it gets weak. It's fruitless to ask for more faith. You already have it. Make a decision to live your life by faith. Release your faith into the situation. Sow it into the situations. When God wanted to connect the natural and the spiritual world, what did he do? He sent the word. Right? In the beginning was the word. Jesus is the word of God. So when God wanted to connect the natural and the spiritual, he sent a word. How are we going to connect the natural and the spiritual? We got to send the word. Send the word. Make sense to you? When was the last time you took and spoke over your situations? You may, some of you guys in this room are facing, I know you are, you're facing situations that are really deep and they're hard. Where, you say, where do I even start? The mess is around me. What am I, how am I even going to get through this? My job is not to worry about how the car runs. My job is just to believe. How's he going to work this situation out? How's this going to happen? I don't know. But God can. God can. Right? God can do that. I'll leave that. How about we just leave that business up to him? How about we just leave the details up to him and for us just to believe? Knowing that he's turning all things together for our good. Knowing that if I go to the fire, guess what? I'm, he's going to be with me, right? There's always a fourth man in the fire. There's always somebody else. He's with me. And if they, he takes me to the fire, guess what? He's going to be with me. If he delivers me from the fire, he's going to be with me. But I'm just going to leave all that business up to him. How about it? And let's just believe. You're talking about rest and peace and jubilee. That's where that happens at. Not trying to, well, God, will believe God. But all of a sudden, we're over here trying to work it out. And we're trying to fret. And we're, 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 we're not sleeping at night. And we're wondering how this is going to work out. And how that's going to work out. I don't know. But my job is just to believe. To put my trust and my confidence in the Lord. And when I put my trust and my confidence in Him. Right? Believing in what Jesus has done for us. Just placing my confidence in that finished work and keep speaking, decreeing, declaring over our lives, right? What God has said about us. Guess what? God starts working. But listen, many Christians aren't doing that. Many Christians are not, they have no divine persuasion at all in their lives. They believe God enough to be saved. But I'm telling you, if you can believe God enough to be saved and you believe that, why can't you believe? Why can't we believe God for whatever it is? Amen. Right. And, and I know we go around the room. We could talk about the agony of defeat in here all, all night if we wanted to. Talking about stuff we didn't see happen or things that we thought would be this way. I don't have all the answers. But I know one thing. He's still God. He's still good. And I know one thing. Listen, I'm not. And I'm not going to let my theology. I'm not God. But I'm not going to let my theology be shaped by, by, by the circumstances and the problems that I'm facing. I'm going to bring my, I'm going to, I'm going to let my situations bend to the theology. That's what happens with a lot of people, what they do. Well, if something, something don't work out, the next thing you know, well, God's not in that now. God's not doing that now. God's not a part of that now. That's all ceased and last passed away with the apostles. Where do we get that from Scripture anyway? Well, all it is is because we're not seeing stuff like we think we should see stuff. And we begin to go and we back up. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. 
I'll be the first to say I don't have all the answers. But I got a title deed. And I know what grace has provided. You guys all right? That's by faith. It's by it's by faith I access this grace. Amen. I'm done. Won't you stand to your feet? Praise the Lord.